Let's go to the book of Hebrews. We're in the first chapter. It is my intent to cover what remains in this chapter. Hebrews, um, it may seem daunting, you know, uh, with uh, as doctrinally um, in-depth as it is, and, you know, you think 13 chapters will be here for a while, but the chapters aren't very long. So we're going to cover one subject matter. We do have a lot to cover in today's lesson, but we can do it all in one shot. So again, verses 4 through 14. Father, help us uh, to understand this complex, doctrinally complex book of Hebrews. Help us to rightly divide it, put it where it needs to be put. Help us to see everything in light of what we need uh, as church members to understand um, what we're reading, I guess, in light of church doctrine. And help us not to confuse it with, necessarily, with uh, church doctrine. Um, we'll be sure to give you praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, verse 4, to get us cracking here. Being so much, being made so much better than the angels. Who? Who was made so much better than the angels? The Lord Jesus Christ, that's the context. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So uh, I've got a bunch of references here. So this is what we're going to follow. Remember, this book of Hebrews is what we would call the better book. Why is it the better book from last week? Anyone remember? Better Testament. Better covenant, better testament. That's what uh, the author of Hebrews is trying to portray to the Hebrew people. What you've been trusting in, there's something better for you. Okay, and so this is the first mention of the word better in the book of Hebrews and the first argument referring to something better, and that is better than the angels. Why reference this to unbelieving Jews? Colossians chapter 2, let's start there. And we'll look at verses 16 through 19. You've already begun to turn there, see? Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. That's basically telling the Christian, don't worry about, um, you know, the, the, the Sabbath rule wasn't for you, that was to the nation of Israel. That's not something you have to worry about. You know, don't worry about the holy days and so on and so forth, which should tell you then the Seventh day Adventists really have no understanding. Because to them, if you don't keep the Sabbath, you've taken the mark of the beast. Okay, we'll read church doctrine and no, it has nothing to do with it. You're, you're completely ignoring Colossians to put that on people. Um, it's a shadow of things to come. That Sabbath was a shadow of uh, something to come. Verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward. See, the Lord wants to reward you, and there are some things that can get in the way of that. In a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head. Right? That's, not, that's like saying that, not holding up the head. Which is who? Christ. Christ. From which all the body by joints and bands having nourish, nourishment ministered and knit together increase, increaseth with the increase of God. So angel worship was a problem 2,000 years ago. It was a problem 4,000 years ago. It's a problem today. Right. Still is. In fact, it's very steeped even in Roman Catholicism. You know, and, you know between saints and icons and relics and angels, all that stuff, you know, they get a little dashboard angel with his head bobbing up and down or whatever. I, I don't understand how that becomes something sacred or holy as it's bouncing around on a dashboard, but this is superstition. This is man. Um, God will not share his glory with anyone or anything, and that includes his angels. Apparently, this was also a Jewish problem, which is why it's being referenced in the book of Hebrews. Go to Acts chapter 7. And I want to show you a little bit of history. What was the big issue? What was the big hang-up for the Jewish people? What, what were their eyes always on? Well, yes, yeah, signs, but that's okay because God ordained it. He ordained what I'm about to talk about as well. But what was the big thing? The law of Moses. 
That was, that, you know, they, that was their hang-up. The law of Moses. Moses said, Moses said, right? So now, Acts 7 and verse 51. There's a little history with angels in Moses, though, and it really took me a little time digging through this to even realize this. I've read the Bible, what, lots of times. And I never really considered this until I had to teach this. So Acts 7:51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. So he's speaking to the nation of Israel, the leaders in particular, this being Stephen, as he's about to be stoned. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? The answer would be none. Right? Which have they not persecuted? None. They persecuted each and every one of them. And they have slain them which uh, showed before the coming of the just one, that's a reference to Jesus, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, verse 53, who have received the law, right, that's their hang-up, by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. The disposition is a word that means to set in order. It's, like, it's almost, like, um, uh, almost like dispense. It's to give out, but to give an order to it. So it's like using the word dispensation and ordained in one word. Say, okay, wait a minute. Didn't God give the law? Well, this is saying it was given by the disposition of angels. Did God give the law or did, did the angels give the law? Go to Galatians chapter 3. God made a, he wrote a very complex book. And when he says study to show yourself approved, there's a reason for it. Galatians 3, 18. For if the inheritance being of the law, or be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. And we're talking, of course, he's arguing with the, um, the Gnostics that came into Galatia talking about going back to the keeping of the law. Verse 19, wherefore, then serveth the law. What was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgression. It wasn't added to make you holy. It was because you were unholy, so God gave you a set of rules. Well, now we've got to govern you guys because you guys are all over the place. So that's, and that's why any law is made. Why do they put a speed limit out there? So that you don't do 100 miles an hour down you know, a school zone. Because... I might be <laughs> inclined to do that. I got to be honest, you know. So they put up that and say, because of transgressions, because of guys like you that'll do a hundred. Here's the law. Amen. That's that's why it was given. Till the seed should come. So the law was given until Jesus should come, whom the promise was made, and it, the law, was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Well, who's the mediator? This is confusing to some people, right? Because there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about in the matter of salvation. It's talking about in the mediation of the law. Who stood between God and the people when it came to the law? Moses. Moses is the mediator. But it was ordained by angels. That means it was ordered by angels written by the finger of, so God pens it. They're all present on Sinai, and I'm going to show you another cross-reference in Psalm. They're all present there, angels, Moses, God. God writes it with his fingers. The angels hand it off to Moses, give him the orders and the direction. He takes it. He mediates between God and the people with the law. Look at Psalm 68. I never thought about the angels being present here. Because Exodus doesn't talk about it. You've got to go to some other places. 68, Psalm 68 and verse 8. So why does this matter? I don't know, just because it's in the Bible. I've got to teach it. I don't know why it matters. There's lots of things that may or may not matter. If you're, looking, if you're always looking for what am I going to get out of this, close up the book. Look, look, for, look for what God wants to teach you, not for what you think you want to know. Psalm 68, verse 8 says, The earth shook, 
The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. So what are we talking about here? This is the giving of the law, right? At Sinai, verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. They were there, 20,000. Angelic messages, chariots of God, 20,000 on the Sinai visitation. How about that? So we had to weave through scriptures to get this one um, from this one little line referenced in the book of Hebrews about angel worship. Why were they so obsessed about angel worship? Well, I got to imagine that orator, oratory tradition. Well, Moses was up there and he comes down and he's talking with Joshua and he's talking with Caleb and they're like, you know, when he was up there and his face, his countenance changed, he says he was there with God. There were angels, 20,000 chariots of fire around, the, around Sinai and so people are, ooh, ooh, chariots. You say, well, why would they be all excited about the angels? Why were they excited about a golden calf? Because the nature of man is to just go, ooh, something greater than me and to just get right down and begin worshiping it, or a better ball player than me. You know, Michael Jordan, or whoever, right? Plug in whatever. <laughs> that's just, that's, it's the heart of man. He's so superstitious and he's so, he's got a God-shaped hole in his heart. He knows he has to worship something. Typically, especially in America, in these last days, an agnostic America, the, the biggest God in America is the one that people see in the mirror every morning. So Jesus is better than 20,000 chariots of God that descended with the law of Moses. What's the point? It's to prove to the Jew that Jesus is better than everything they're super, superstitiously trusting in. The law was given by Moses. Oh, Moses, oh, the law. Yeah, it's not greater than Jesus. Jesus made Moses and he wrote the law. Right? But what do we do? Well, we worship Moses and the law. Makes no sense. That's humanity. The law was ordered by angels. Angels came down, talked to Moses and said, here's what God has given. This is the order. Okay, but the angels were created by Jesus. That's what he's trying to get across to these superstitious people. The Jewish religion, much like Roman Catholicism, puts too much emphasis on the external and visible things that they can see and touch and handle. I was recently asked, when I reference Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, why don't you say St. John? Why don't you say St. Luke? Why do you need me to? St. Seth. <laughs> I'm just going to start referring to myself as St. Seth. <laughs> crazy, crazy the way people get so superstitious. Um, but, you know, so rather than this external visible tradition, how about we get our eyes on the invisible God? Right? He's the invisible God. Why don't we just, you know what I mean by turning our eyes? We can't see that which is invisible, but we can see and pay attention to and give our devotion to that which is invisible as, instead of the external stuff. So the thinking is flawed. Man's thinking is flawed. Hebrews is written to correct thinking. Right? Hebrews is to the Jew what Romans is to the Gentile. And if you've read Romans, and I hope you have, there was a lot he had to say to you, even building up to Jesus about who you are as a human being. Just read Romans 1 sometime. So he's now going to the Jews, and instead of starting with, you know, you're this kind of wicked, you're this kind of wicked, he's just going right to the heart of what their problem was. You guys worship wrong. I called you out of Ur of the Chaldees. I set you up with the law. I set you up with all these things. You've seen all these signs and wonders, and for all that, you worship the signs and wonders instead of me who gave it all. That's what he's saying. Uh, Luke chapter, actually I'm ahead of myself, um, it says, for unto which of the angels, verse 5, back in Hebrews, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
Um, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to a son. Uh, shall be to me a son. He's saying so. So he's going to continue along this angelic argument, and he's saying, which of the angels did I say, hey, 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 son? And what's the answer? Well, none. He's talking about the angels, not the angel of God. He's saying, to which of the angels did I say, thou art my son? None. Angels are not begotten. They're created. You say, well, what's begotten? Well, Jesus wasn't created. He was begotten. He was and always was because he's eternal. But he was begotten in a body of flesh as the Holy Spirit of God descended upon Mary and overshadowed her and she conceived and she, Jesus was, be, he went into a body of flesh. That's the only begotten Son of God. I'm a Son of God, but I'm not a begotten Son of God. You see the difference? Okay, next verse, verse 6, and again, when he bringeth into the first, uh, bringeth into the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. So when did this happen? Because there's argument here. This is the funny thing. I'm reading some of these commentaries. And I mean, I think it may be even Schofield. Uh, I'd have to look at it. But whoever, there were a few commentaries that said, well, this is about the millennium. You know, when the angels of God will be worshiping him. And I said, but we're talking about his first begetting. So that has nothing to do with the millennium. That has to do with his incarnation. So that's Luke chapter 8, and I can show you where the angels of God worshipped him. Let's take a look at it. You know the story, right? You get it from Charlie Brown and Snoopy every year. Linus quotes it. Isn't that funny? I love it. Linus quotes the King James Bible every year. To a bunch of people that couldn't care less about what he said, they just like the do 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 right? I love that song. It's a great song. Yeah. What did he? Do? What did Linus just tell you? That we ought to love one one another first. That's the season of love and peace. That's not what he told you. He said, "For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord." <laughs> but. Luke 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. I feel like I need to wear like a shepherd's thing and suck my thumb a little bit when I say this. Verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said, a little side note for those of you who love the Charlie Brown thing. What was, what was Linus's hang-up? He had a security blanket. What, why would someone need a security blanket? They're a fearful person. This brings them a sense of security. So watch the Charlie Brown special sometime. And, it says, and, and he's, he's quoting, he says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not. And he throws his blanket. Isn't that great? It's almost like Chuck Schultz knew what was going on here, and I think he did. So he had his character who needed that blanket, would never give up that blanket when he says, fear not. That's a good lesson for all of us, I think. Because fear is the absence of faith. And the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. This is why we go out on the street corner. We say, we're giving you the gospel. We're bringing you good news. This is not bad news. This is good news. To all people, verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel that was giving the message a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men. They were praising God, they were worshiping God, and that God was incarnated, begotten as Jesus Christ. And Hebrews lets you know who that God is. So you can imagine a Hebrew man reading this and going, what are they talking about? 
You know, this is, this is blasphemy. Um, let's get the next verse, verse 7. And, the, and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So he makes his angels spirits. Angels are spirit beings. I say that so that we understand that should you encounter a spirit being, and you certainly could, it is not likely, in fact, probably 99.9999999% not going to be a departed loved one. You say, well, would you say 100%? That's pretty close. And the only reason I can't give you 100% is what I'm about to show you. But go to Matthew chapter 18. Despite their coming in the form of grandma, dad, brother, sister, cousin, nephew, what have you. If they're coming to you with a message, I would be very, very worried. So I'm hoping, I don't suspect there's anyone here that's communing with the dead. The Lord gave, he told you not to do it. There's a reason for it, because they're deceptive spirits. And anyone that's willing to channel a spirit, God bless you, will have a spirit willing to be channeled. And they're not going to come to you with truth, because, see, Satan's a liar, and he's the father of all liars, human or angelic. Matthew 18, verse 10 says, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. This is Jesus talking about the little people that, you know, the little children he put on, put on his lap. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. What does this mean? From this verse, I've heard it many, many times. We'll see that everyone has a guardian angel. You know, and this, this is talking about the guardian angel of the children. Okay. I disagree. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, the little ones being the people. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the, the face of my Father which is in heaven. So he's referring to the little ones in heaven. Their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So now angels are spirits. The spirits of these little ones, you all have a spirit. Their angel, their spirit, does always behold the face of my Father in heaven. This isn't about an angel that guards over human beings. He's saying, listen, when the little ones get into heaven, they are always beholding the face of my Father. That's their spirit. Does that make sense? So these little, the, the spirits of these little ones behold the face of God in heaven. Save people who have departed do not typically return to earth. The exception would be Moses, Elijah, Mount of Transfiguration, right? But I would also remind you that Elijah didn't leave his body here. Right? He just departed. So he didn't die and come back. Say, well, what about Moses? Moses died. Yes, he did. But what happened to his body? The book of Jude would tell us that the angels were fighting over it. The wicked angels wanted his body. For what? Maybe to inhabit it? I don't know. I mean, this is crazy stuff, right? But, so, maybe those guys you can't really count as having died and come back. I don't know. But I can tell you that Samuel did. And if you know the story, I'm not going to have us turn there. It's, it's 1 Samuel, those taking notes. 1 Samuel 28, verses 12 through 15. Saul goes after the witch at Endor. And he's like, I want you to bring up Samuel. And so she calls, a, you know, she does her, reads her magic tea leaves and gazes into the crystal ball and, 
you know, she's got $20 an hour sign up on her front of, the, of her trailer park. <laughs> right? It's the funniest thing in the world. They're all in trailer parks. Like, can't, can't you take some of that foreknowledge and win the lottery, man? What's the matter? <laughs> I don't understand. Well, that's not how it works. Right, it doesn't work. Not always, but sometimes. So she goes and calls Samuel out, and I think even she wasn't expecting it. Because when she saw him, she screamed. Well, listen, if you're used to dealing with spirits, why would this surprise you that you have a spirit in front of you? So this was probably her first experience. You know, she was, a, she was someone that charged money and just pretended, and this is what, this is what your great-grandpa says to you. Everything's fine. I'm good. I'm in heaven. Your life's about to get better. Your luck is going to change. You're going to find some love. You're going to run into some money. Oh, read the horoscopes. They say the same thing. Right? Very generic. Always positive. Yeah. And every once in a while, you'll run into some people who are, who are very legitimate. Do we have time? I'm going to share this with you. Um, I knew some... You know that... Uh, what is that witch's coven thing down? Is it Lilydale? Um... I knew somebody years ago that went to uh, one of those things and she, you know, she was very uh, impressed. She knew I was a religious man, so she wanted to talk to me about uh, what she had experienced religiously. Um, and you know, she, she was going on and on about how uh, this, this person was able to go into her past and tell her thing after thing after thing about what had happened to her in her past. And, I, and I, so I made the point, and I, I asked her a question. I said, well, what did she charge you? She's like, oh, it was only $50. I said, okay. So she charged you $50 to tell you something you already knew? <laughs> She's just kind of looking at me. Well, yeah, but it was incredible. I said, okay, but you knew it, right? You already knew it. So you gave her 50 bucks for what? Did she tell you anything in your future? Well, she mentioned some things. I said, okay, but they're unprovable things. What did she say? You know, the stuff that's in the past. So if this woman was able to do that, then maybe she had a demonic spirit. Maybe she had a familiar spirit that she consulted. And a familiar spirit can see the past. They can't know the future. They're not God. But they could see something that happened to you in your past. That might even have been someone that was a, a spirit that was around that girl vexing her on a regular basis. I and mean, what made you go to Lilydale in the first place? Right, so I mean... But I tried to convince her. I, I got her at least thinking. I just coughed up 50 bucks. For what? Right. Um, if there's spiritual activity going on down here, it's not going to be a loved one, folks. Okay? They're, they're not coming down and communing with you. They, if they're saved, they're in the presence of the Lord, and they're very blissfully in the presence of the Lord. Okay, uh, they stay in heaven. Why would they want to come back? Right. The Bible says in church doctrine to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It doesn't say here and there present with the Lord. It's present with the Lord. Second Corinthians five eight. Um, this verse also says that his ministers are a flame of fire. So this is likely direct, uh, directly related to a particular class of angels. So, it, but it might also have to do with the cherubim as well. But go to Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah 6, this is a, just a wonderful chapter. I keep saying, I've got to teach this one day. And, you know, I've been pastoring for, what, 11 years, and I've yet to actually teach these verses. I often reference them. I often read the whole chapter, but I don't actually teach it. And I'm not going to today. We're referencing it. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah died, I also... Uh, uh, the, uh, th I'm sorry, let me reread that properly. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also, or I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Twain, he covered his face. With twain, he covered his feet. With twain, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Here's a human being seeing this. Because I am a man of unclean lips. That's everyone in this room. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That's everyone outside of this room. For mine eyes have seen the King, 
the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand. What's a live coal? A hot coal. It's on fire. Which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. Thank you, seraphim. You couldn't even pick that thing up with your hand. You used it with tongs and then touched me with it. Appreciate that, <laughs> all right? There's a reason for it, which I'm not going to teach today. He laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So look how these seraphim are associated with live coals. They're associated with fire, uh, which would burn the skin, of course. Seraphim actually means burning. Um, which is, and I think t tonight uh, Frank is teaching angelology and demonology for those of you who are interested. Um, and I think he references seraphim, we'll see, and I'm pretty sure he'll reference th uh, the meaning of their name. Um, but it's a mysterious class of angels uh, of which we know very little other than what's here. Um, but then I also thought about the cherubims, which are not seraphim. They're a different class of angels. Uh, and in Genesis 3.24, if you remember, after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, they were not allowed back in. And how did they guard? Swords, swords yeah, the, the, the uh, swords of fire, flaming swords. So uh, these angels, they're, they're ministers, uh, his ministers, a flame of fire. So they're not someone you want to be trifling with. Uh, Hebrews 1, verse 8 and 9. Am I even on the right source here? These verses. Psalm 45. Yeah, I'm in the right place. Hebrews 1, 8. This is what happens when I don't look at my slides in the morning. I'm like, what am I looking? Why did I do this? Okay. Uh, Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9 say, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So let me ask you a question. What angel, referring to the angelic host, has a throne? Well, none that I know of, even though they are referred to as princes in the scripture. So if they do have a form of a throne somewhere, it's not an eternal one. But unto the Son, Jesus, God says, get this now, thy throne, O God. Make sure you understand that. God the Father calls the Son God in verse 8. And then in verse 9 it says, To the Son, God, even thy God, in reference to the Father. So this is why the Trinity is so confusing to people. So the Father calls the Son God, and the Father refers to himself as the Son's God. And that's why Jesus is both God and also said, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and unto my God and to your God. That's John 20 and verse 17. So you have to understand that Jesus is God and you have to understand that he has God. And that's the Father. So now these verses here in Hebrews 1 verses 8 and 9, they're a quotation of Psalm 45, which uh, I'll read it for you how it's quoted in the Old Testament. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Right? It's an eternal throne. That's why it's not one of the angels. This is referring to Jesus. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. See, isn't that interesting? I mean, it's telling you there. It's such a unique verse. It's such a unique verse. Thy throne, O God, verse 6. Therefore thy God... Verse 7. So it's just, without this, you would be, I mean, think about it. If all you had was Psalm 45, you'd be, what is he talking about? How is it that the Jews would read the Psalms and go, what are they ta what's he talking about here? He can't be talking about David's throne, because why would he refer to him as God? 
Who is this? Well, this has to be the Christ. Right. So then why find you it's such an, a, a profound thing that Christ took worship and is God? It lets you know he was going to be. So as the psalm stands alone, wouldn't, one wouldn't know that uh, wouldn't know this about Jesus. You needed New Testament revelation coming from the book of Hebrews, which then now quotes it and explains it to you. I don't understand all of Revelation without Daniel. And before Revelation came, I didn't understand much of Daniel. You need, you need the whole revelation of God to understand parts of the revelation of God. I've been trying to explain this for 11 plus years. Don't just read little snippets of Bible verses. Be acquainted with the whole thing so that you understand it. God doesn't want us to be ignorant regarding his word. He wants us to be in the know. He wouldn't have written it for you if, you, if, if he didn't want you to read it and know it. So the Holy Ghost is using Paul, we believe, to reveal Christ, which is the intent of the scripture, through the Old Testament laws and ordinances. Rather than see Christ, they, the Hebrews, saw and worshiped the laws and the ordinances. We were talking about that earlier. That was never the point of the ordinances. Here's law number one. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the law. Worship the law. No. Why did I give you the law? Because it's going to point you to something. Well, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3.24. So why did I give you the psalm? Well, along comes the Holy Ghost giving you the book of Hebrews to explain the psalm so he could remind you, listen, this psalm was directing you as a schoolmaster. Come on, child. Come on, son. I want you to see Jesus. That's why it was given. And thank God that we have the full 66 books of the Bible. We have the complete revelation. We have everything you are going to need in this life. I can't speak of the life to come. You're going to have God's presence with you. I don't know what kind of word he's going to give you, but you'll be in the presence of the living word. But for now, in this life, he's given you all you need that pertains to life and godliness, how to be saved, how to walk after you're saved, how to know you're saved. And really, that's, this life is just a, you know, it's a shadow of things to come. So this is just a stepping stone to the next life. Don't be so wrapped up in what's going on here. It doesn't matter as much. Get your soul secure. Live for the God who you're going to spend eternity with so that when you're in eternity, you'll be rewarded and walking like kings and priests as you ought to and do what it is that he asks you to do in eternity future. Okay, now this is fun stuff and we're running out of time. So let's move quickly. Verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. So this is a continuous thought with verse 9. Thou in verse 9 refers to the Son, and so does verse 10. So thou, the Son of God, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth. The heavens are the work of the hands of Jesus Christ. That's the text. Again, imagine the burning of the unbelieving Jew as he gazed upon the text. Imagine the conviction. Should he have been under the conviction that was leading him towards repentance and faith, imagine the conviction over, I, well, we just crucified our king. And that king was God who made the heavens and the earth and the law and the angels and all that, and we just killed him. If this is true, what have I done? And that's why you can go back to the book of Acts. They said that as well when Peter is preaching about how they killed their Messiah. They said, what must we do? They didn't say, what must we do to be saved, right? This wasn't about the salvation of your soul. They said, what must we do? He says, well, get baptized and re you know, repent. And he's because he was still talking about John's message to the nation of Israel 
You need to be prepared to see the coming of the just one because Peter thought, well, he's going to return anytime soon. So the message stays the same. That's what they're going to be preaching during the tribulation. The king's coming. The king's coming. You better get prepared. You better get prepared. Only it's now it's... Now, don't get water baptized. It's, don't take the mark of the beast. But it's the same thing. His kingdom is coming. That's the message. It's the kingdom gospel. Verse 11. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they, referring to the heavens, shall wax old as doth a garment. So the creation's going to pass away. Jesus will not. That's the simple meaning of the text. Next verse, verse 12. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So like a scroll that God is done reading, he's going to fold them up and lay them aside. These verses doctrinally are very complex. Outer space is likened unto God's garment or vesture. You see it in the text? Clothing, my clothing, and not to sound crude, but my clothing is what keeps you from seeing all of me. Space is God's clothing to keep him concealed from sinful humanity. One day he's going to take off the vesture and people will see God. And I don't mean in a perverse way. So take it from the perverse way and do it in a holy way. And they're going to see God. That's the doctrine behind the text. Look at Isaiah 65, 2 Peter. You've got the text there. We're almost done. You know, as a body of believers, we've got to start encouraging all of the body of believers at Bible Believers to be here for both messages. Really, I mean, look at what you're missing by not being here. This is cool stuff. Isaiah 65, verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. I'm taking off my garment, and I'm not going to put that garment back on. I'm folding it up, I'm laying it aside. 2 Peter 3.12 says, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So you know what this means? God won't go naked. He's changing his clothes. Because he's laying one aside and he's creating another. So he's gone all these millennium wearing the same outfit. He says, well... It's been a few thousand years, time to change the clothes. So a little more reveal, maybe the garment, and again, this isn't in a perverse way, but maybe the garment will be a little more revealing. Well, now that we've dealt with sin, I can let you see more of me and I can see more of you. We, maybe I don't need such a dark garment anymore. Maybe the heavens will be filled with light. I don't know. Conjecture. Verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? What's the answer? None. The Father never said that or anything like that to any angel, but he did say it to the Son. And here's the reference, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said uh, uh, unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So again, David said that to the Lord Jehovah, Right? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Lord said unto my Lord, capital L, little O-R-D, that's Adonai. So the Lord, the Lord, Jehovah said unto Adonai, that's Jesus. He said, sit, uh, he said, uh, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That, of course, is after Jesus' incarnation, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. He says unto the Son, Jehovah says to Adonai, sit at my right hand until we've subdued every single enemy of yours. Amen. And that fulfillment will come at Armageddon and in the valley of Jehoshaphat, when he brings all the Democrats and the Republicans of the United States of America into the valley and says, you're all a bunch of wicked reprobates. Amen. 
bunch of conservatives pretending to be conservative, even though you're liberals, a bunch of liberals who are a bunch of flamers and don't love me at all. Anyhow, yep. let me talk to you both about what's right and what would have made the United States of America a great nation. It wouldn't be Donald Trump, not that I'm against Donald Trump, but what will make America great again is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? They who? The angels, okay, to which God was referring. They are ministering spirits sent forth as in to here, here in earth, sent forth to earth, to minister on behalf of the heirs, heirs, plural, of salvation. That's not ministering to, unto Jesus, the heir of salvation. That's ministering unto those who would receive salvation by grace through faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Ghost is saying, listen, is it, does it make sense that you would worship that which is here to minister to you? And that's what he's telling to the Jew. You guys are bowing down to these images and these relics of, of angels and you're into this angel worship and I'm letting you know that the law didn't save you, the angels who gave, uh, that ordained the law didn't save you, Moses who told you about the law, that mediator, he didn't save you. Let's talk about God who created the law and why he created the law as a schoolmaster to lead you to Christ. So lay aside the angel worship, lay aside Moses and he's, he's gonna go into those arguments about Moses and the law and he's going to go into all that. But he began with angels. Jesus is better than the angels. We don't worship angels. Angels would tell you, get up. An angel of God would tell you, get up. A false angel would receive the worship. Okay? Ooh, look at our timing. Okay, Father, uh, thank you so much for everything that we've seen in this uh, wonderful book of Hebrews, Lord. Such a great book. I can't wait to dive in even further. Um, so I do pray, Lord, that uh, your people would have been, uh, I guess, edified and encouraged this morning to continue to study uh, the scriptures on their own and to maybe look ahead into Hebrews chapter 2 and see what lies ahead and see if they can uh, ascertain what you're trying to teach us through it. Uh, before I teach it, Lord, so that they can know if I'm saying what I'm saying is true, and uh, that we might, might all encourage one another through Thy Word, and uh, be with us in this hour to come, Lord God, and as we sing praises to You and as we worship You again in the Word of God, we pray in Jesus' name, Amen.